thank you very much, Michael, Mikhail, for such a wonderful uh, introduction and history of Ipkri. And uh, I feel that uh, uh, we owe as much to the partnership of CAS as uh, uh, also CAS actually have been very helpful and in both Jerusalem and Ramallah. And uh, in our uh, just uh, talk uh, a minute ago, we, uh, I, I found out that you are still also heading the Ramallah office until the end of the year. So uh, for us from Ipkri, I would like to extend my deepest regards and thanks to CAS Jerusalem and to CAS Ramallah for a wonderful relationship that I hope will continue and grow under Riman and Dan. Uh, for me, this is a slight, uh, like an uh, epilogue, reminiscing about the past, maybe thinking a little bit about the future, but uh, the future is not in my hand. I think it's in the hand of the younger generation. And I hope, like you, that Ipkri in the next five years will also realize uh, the goal of uh, its being created, which is to support the two-state solution, that this will happen hopefully in the next five years. Although if we want to read the political map today, it's so bleak that I don't know what uh, has yet to be done and uh, uh, how to think out of the box in order to uh, jumpstart a process that is today actually is uh, uh, going nowhere. I, I would like to start by talking a little bit about myself. You know, I was born here in Jerusalem. I was raised in Jerusalem. I went to high school in Jerusalem and then went and studied in the United States. And uh, there I studied something different from what my parents wanted. My family owns a pharmacy. It's still there inside the old city of Jerusalem, inside Damascus Gate. And they wanted me to be a pharmacist. Eventually, I did. I studied pharmacy. And I graduated from all places in the world, from another holy city in India, Banaras, and uh, became a pharmacist, and uh, uh, ran uh, and worked as a pharmacist, as a professional, in the old city of Jerusalem. Until in 1971, the cousin of my wife, his name is Yusuf Nasser, <coughs> Joe Nasser, we called him, he started the Palestinian newspaper Al Fajr. And he advocated also the two state solution and he wanted to see self determination for the Palestinian people. However, he also paid a very heavy price his own life because in 1971, no, 73, February 1973, he was kidnapped and we never saw him again. <coughs> And this is how I became active in politics. The family asked me to look after the newspaper that he started. He started a weekly in Arabic under my uh, or after, uh, directorship. Or I, I joined it actually from the top down because I, I, I knew very little about journalism. Today I'm more known as a professional journalist than anything else, not, not even a pharmacist. But I, when I joined Al Fajr, I, I hardly knew anything about journalism. I learned the business. I developed the newspaper from uh, a, a weekly to a daily. I worked with my colleague, Saman Puri, to create the English version of Al Fajr. And we worked there for many years. And I think this also put me in the spotlight when in July 1985, the PLO chose me as representing the West Bank to be part of what was called at that time the Joint Palestinian-Jordanian Delegation. And uh, this put me in a also in a new, different uh, level. I tried during that period also to work in order because uh, we Palestinians 
all the time said that if peace is to be found, is if peace is to be negotiated, it's the, the uh, Israeli government, the international community, and especially the United States had to start to talk to the PLO. And I worked with people like George Schultz, George Schultz. I was invited to visit uh, after the start of the first Intifada, Washington and the State Department, and told Mr. Schultz face to face that the only way to move forward is really to talk directly to the PLO. And thank God, I think he listened. And the last thing that he did as Secretary of State uh, is that he also helped with the for, former late foreign minister of uh, Sweden, Sten Anderson, to recognize the PLO in a famous speech that Yasser Arafat gave in Geneva. So I helped relations, normalizing relations between the leadership of the Palestinian people, the PLO, and the United States, and eventually that also to the Oslo talks uh, uh, between Israel and the PLO. I don't want to talk more about these issues, but I want to say that when Gershon, I think in 1989, 88, I was the editor of the Jerusalem and Fajr Daily Arabic paper, came to me, visit me in my office, and he said, he wants to create an organization that will bring Israelis and Palestinians to talk about the two-state solution. I said, I'll, I'll help in any way possible. And actually, I became a member of the board for a few years, and later on became the chairman of the board, until later on when I retired from Al Fajr, and uh, the opportunity arose and uh, then I was invited to change position from being the co-chairman of uh, EPCRI to become the director for a few years, I think. It was in 19, in uh, 2005. Okay, that means almost seven years with uh, the daily uh, work of uh, uh, EPCRI. And this is where I met my colleague here, Riman who also came to join us in the department uh, that was actually very active in bringing Israelis and Palestinians together. And this is how also met many of our Palestinian leaders. We have here Dr. Maher Kurt, who we worked together in Ibqri with Kas to create what was uh, at that time the most important economic chaos, uh, or uh, what we call it, the economic round table where we brought Palestinians and Israelis to sit down together to find out solutions to many of the issues that were uh, in, a, in a way unable to be solved officially between the government of Israel and the Palestinian Authority. And we had, we had banking crisis, we had many other issues that uh, our input and the uh, actually determination of the people who were in the round table, both Israelis and Palestinians, helped resolve the, uh, the problem. I, I remember very clearly that whatever decisions we were able to take, we presented them to the highest level politically in Israel and in Palestine. It reached up to the Israeli Prime Minister and reached up to the Palestinian President. It previously it used to be Yasser Arafat and now to Abu Mazen. Uh, these were the days that really IPCRI was critical and involved. And there were times, especially during the Second Intifada, when the links were broken down, but IPCRI stayed alive and active and kept this threat ongoing in the most difficult time. And I believe now we are inheriting a new, similar, uh, actually, period and uh, now, under the guidance of Dan and Riman, they are facing the same problems, probably in a way sometimes more complex, because uh, the leadership today on both sides are unable to talk. And this is why 
the presence of FCRI, the continuation of uh, work of FCRI, the cooperation that we are doing with CAS is very important in order to keep the threat alive. Now, I am what I call an unorthodox political player. I always expose the unpopular. And I remember, I, I learned my actually politics from a, a Palestinian communist leader, uh, Abu Abid al Barghouti. Bashir al Barghouti. And at that time, I told him, what is the most important thing to do? He said, we have to have the Palestinian people recognize Security Council Resolution 242 and 338. I said, if this is important, why you cannot do it? And he told me, I will be ostracized. It happened that it fell on my shoulder to say publicly here in Jerusalem that we have to accept 242 and 338. And at that time, all the wars of East Jerusalem was written on it that I am a traitor to the Palestinian cause. Today, the Oslo agreement is based on 242 and 338. And the Palestinians, when they are negotiating with Israel, they say the most important clause or a security council resolution is 242 and 338. So sometimes you have to have some advocate for uh, ideas. I am uh, uh, retiring from IPCRI on the active the daily list, but I'm not act, uh, actually retiring from active political life. Uh, you know, there is now an idea ongoing here about uh, talking. I, I will finish uh, in, in two minutes. Uh, uh, confederation has an idea between Israel and Palestine. We used to talk previously of confederation between Palestine and Jordan, and it's still a very good and valid idea to be done. But for the people who cannot give up an inch of Palestine, or for Israelis who cannot give an inch of Eretz Israel, a confederation between Israel and Palestine as a starter is also a good thing because then we can have a border which is actually uh, in line like the green line, and then that we can also find solutions to all our problems from refugees to settlers. Yeah. And also we can find a solution to uh, Jerusalem being the capital of both Israel and Palestine. I'm encouraging that idea. But uh, the people I'm working with today want to have a confederation before having a Palestinian state. Usually, in a confederation, it's very well known that it is between two independent states that they make a deal together, they are working together. But even with that shortcoming, I'm still encouraging the confederal idea of a solution. Uh, I, I said at the beginning, I am an advocate of it, the two-state solution, but I'm willing to work with other alternatives. Like in 1987, I talked about running for elections for the municipality of Jerusalem. You know, uh, it's very important to show the Israeli complacent, sorry to say it, Israeli public, that there is a demographic issue and that there are Palestinians next door living with them. And if we sit and do nothing, and in Jerusalem we are 34% of the public, of the citizens of Jerusalem, yet we don't vote, we don't act, we don't protect our rights. Uh, and it already have been proven politically that there is a big difference between national elections and local elections. Uh, the Palestinians after Oslo have won the right nationally in East Jerusalem to vote in the Palestinian entity in the, in, in, uh, for the Palestinian legislative body, the PLC. So it is possible to think, and uh, in November of next year, one year and a month away from today, there is a possibility of another mayoral elections in Jerusalem. And I think the Palestinians, not because we are in love with uh, being part of the 
respect this, but also to make the Israeli public understand that there is a majority, actually there is a minority in East Jerusalem that is living with no uh, daily uh, political rights of how to run the city, how to zone the city, how to build, you know, it takes two to three years sometimes to get a building license in East Jerusalem. Uh, these are the issues of daily life in the city, and it should not be mixed with the political future of East Jerusalem. You, we can run a state in Jerusalem calling for uh, participation in the election, but saying that in the future we want to have East Jerusalem as the capital of Palestine. We are already uh, actually in the process, process in the Oslo process recognize West Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. So there are still many things to be done. I cannot in the future do what I did in 87, but I'm willing and we will be working with other younger generation people in order to encourage going out of the box in order to move the political process. Thank you very much.